Hi there, everyone. My name is Prereg Juthani. I'm a second year resident at Stanford, and today I want to talk to you a bit about point of care ultrasound and how you can utilize it when a patient is hypotensive, when their pressures are particularly low. This video is going to be a great introduction to point of care ultrasound if you're a medical student or even if you're a resident. And I think it's a video that you can ultimately utilize in a clinical context because point of care ultrasound is something that is becoming more and more popular to utilize at the bedside. And specifically when someone has low blood pressure, point of care ultrasound can help us look at all of the vital organs and figure out why someone may actually be hypotensive. Today's video is only going to focus on the cardiac aspects of ultrasound, but in future videos I hope to also speak a bit about how we can utilize them to look at the lung as well as even the abdomen and figure out if there's other reasons why someone might be hypotensive in that regard. With that being said, there's three main objectives for today's video. The first one is to describe the principles of ultrasound and the applications in hemodynamic assessment. The second one is to ultimately interpret ultrasound findings and figure out why it ends up leading us to think about something in a separate way. So for example, if I think someone's hypotensive because their heart isn't working well, and I look at the, the POCUS images of their heart, that actually can then share insight into do I agree with my assessment or is that am I really wrong and then do I need to reconsider? And the third thing is I want you to slowly start to learn how to integrate point of care ultrasound in your clinical decision making because I do think these are becoming more and more popular and I think as they are and as we learn to utilize them I do think they can be a very important piece of objective data that can help us with decision making. With that being said, there is no way that I would be able to make this video without these two sources. So I want to give a big shout out to the Point of Care Ultrasound book by Dr. Sony. It's a phenomenal book. I will link it in the description below if you would want to go ahead and buy a, purchase a copy. I don't have any affiliate link. I just think it's a phenomenal book. And the second thing is the POCUS 101 website, which I will also link in the description below. It's a fantastic website that goes over all the fundamentals of POCUS. And this is just, as I said, an introductory video focused on the heart. So with that being said, let's go ahead and start with what is po what is POCUS? POCUS means point of care ultrasound. You're using ultrasound waves to basically send those waves through the body. And as they hit things, those waves will then essentially reverberate back. And we will then be able to transduce them and figure out what we're looking at. There's different arrays. Um, there's different um, probes that we often use in ultrasound. There's three big probes that I'm going to show you here. There's the phase array probe, there's a curvilinear probe, and then there's a linear probe. The big thing I want you to take away for today is usually when I'm looking at the heart, you want to use the phase array probe. Usually the differences between the probes is that the linear probe, for example, is very, very high frequency. So the waves that it sends out are very, very high frequency waves. And I want you to remember that the higher the frequency, the smaller the depth. So a very high frequency probe probe will essentially allow you to only look at superficial structures. So the linear probe is usually only good to look at vessels that are very superficial. But the phase array probe, you'll notice that it's lower frequency, but it allows you to look a bit deeper, which is much better when you're trying to look at the heart, which is actually below the ribs and sometimes even below the, below the lungs in certain, in certain views, right? And today I told you we're going to focus on the cardiac ultrasound, but specifically I'm going to tell you about how to utilize it when you're thinking about why someone might be hypotensive. And so just remember that as your context. Imagine that you get a page, or even if you're a medical student, let's say maybe one of your senior residents tells you, hey, someone's hypotensive, how do you want to approach this? This ultrasound technique can really help you, okay? And as I walk you through all of these things, I'm also going to show you the very important views that are important in cardiac ultrasound. So let's go ahead and get started. We're, we're already there. So you're going to be using your phase array probe. And the first thing I want to tell you is let's say you're going to a patient and you want to assess their heart. The first thing people will usually get you to look at is the parasternal long axis view. The way you look at the parasternal long axis view is you take the phase array probe, you want to point it to the patient's right shoulder, and you often want to put it on the um, left side of their chest, left side of the patient's chest, facing the right shoulder around the third to fourth rib space. If you can do that, you'll see that you're kind of cutting the heart in this axis such that you will then be able to see these aspects of the heart. So you'll see the left atrium, left ventricle, you'll see the left ventricular outflow tract, you'll see the aorta here, and you have the right ventricle anterior to the left ventricle. 
in this view, you will be able to see so many things. And that's why this view is so important. It's going to take you a lot of time to slowly get this view. But just remember, put it right here, kind of move it around. If you can find this view, you can get a lot of information. The three big things that we're going to talk about today are the ejection fraction measurement, pericardial effusion measurement, as well as the Doppler measurement. Okay. If you can just get this view, that's a big win. And you'll see that this is the view you're getting, but in ultrasound, the view actually looks like this, right? So it kind of is supposed to show you you're cutting the heart in that that cross section, which is from our textbook, but you'll actually see this, and you'll see that this is the left atrium, left ventricle, anterior heart flow tract, as well as the right ventricle and anterior. Okay, so the first thing I wanna tell you is, I'm going to tell you a lot of big nomenclature, but the big thing you can take away is the fact that in this view, you can get a pretty good assessment of someone's ejection fraction, right? Because in this view, what you will see is that the left atrium and the left ventricle are right here. The thing that separates the left atrium and the left ventricle is the mitral valve. And what you'll see is oftentimes, if someone has decreased ejection fraction, this mitral valve will not hit the wall of the ventricle. But if someone has good ejection fraction, this mitral valve will actually hit that wall. There's a very fancy word for this, which is called the EPSS, which stands for E-point septal separation. And all that means is that you're looking at when this anterior leaflet of the mitral valve hits the wall, how far is it from the wall? Is it, if Does it actually hit the wall? Because if it actually hits the wall, that means you have good ejection fraction. But if it's not moving at all and not hitting the wall at all, you're going to see that it actually doesn't get close to the wall at all. And the way you can measure this is by actually turning on a mode in ultrasound called M mode. And that actually will map out the movement of certain points in a certain line. And if you put a line straight through the mitral valve, you will see how close close it gets to hitting that interventricular septum. And I know this sounds very complicated, so let me just show you a brief example of this, okay? So if you'll see here, I'm playing this video, and you'll see that if you create a line directly between the mitral valve and the septum, you can actually see that this mitral valve is essentially hitting the septum, right? Because um, the mitral valve is getting close and during systole, um, or during the atrial contraction point, it's hitting the septum. And as it hits the septum, there's very little um, space between the mitral valve and the septum. But if someone has decreased ejection fraction, you're gonna see that they actually have, it doesn't hit the septum at all. It actually gets very close to not hitting the septum. And I wanna show you a good example of that right here. So this is someone who has a very decreased EPSS, right? You can look here, the mitral valve is not even getting close to that septum. And so you can see that it's much more than seven millimeters away during um, the most, most, um, systolic function of the atrium, right? During that aspect, it's not even hitting the ventricle, ventricular wall. And here you have decreased ejection fraction because you'll see that's not moving at all. But in this one, you'll see that it actually has pretty decent ejection fraction because it is hitting the, um, the interventricular septum. So just by looking at this view, you don't have to necessarily even turn on M mode, but you can just grossly look. And if you can see that mitral valve hitting the septum, you can essentially rule out worsening heart failure or rule out acute heart failure as a cause of someone's hypotension. But if you're seeing something like this, you can't necessarily rule it out. You can't say that it's the cause, but you can say that this person definitely has decreased ejection fraction. The other cool part is that in this same view of the parasternal long axis, you can also rule out the second thing that I like to call pericardial effusion. So in this parasternal long axis view, you'll see that um, the very outer aspects of the peristernal lung is the pericardium of the heart. And the pericardium of the heart is where sometimes if you have a pericardial effusion, fluid will build up. And the really amazing part about fluid is that it is anechoic, which means it's black on ultrasound. So you will be able to actually see if someone has a pericardial effusion because it will build up here and you should be able to see it in a peristernal long axis view. And why is this important? Well, if someone is hypotensive, one thing that can definitely cause hypotension is tamponade. And tamponade means that you have so much fluid in the pericardial space that the pressure that the pericardial space fluid is exerting on that right atrium is higher um, 
than the actual filling pressure of the right atrium or the right ventricle. And that then leads to impeded um, blood flow return to the right atrium and ultimately impeded outflow from the right ventricle, which then leads to impeded inflow to the left ventricle, which then leads to hypotension, right? And so pericardial effusions and then essentially, essentially tamponade can be ruled out in this view. And so if you stick a probe on someone and you're able to see a pericardial effusion, that can be really helpful because that can be really... Um, uh, elucidate another cause of hypotension. And I want to show you here again, you can see that there's a very small pericardial effusion right here. Um, and again, notice that fluid is anechoic, aka black. And so it's going to be pretty obvious when someone has one. One thing that I want to point out that we didn't talk about as much is that sometimes the pericardial space can sometimes be confused with the pleural space. The pleural space is actually directly posterior to the pericardium, and sometimes you may see some anechoic fluid there, but that is actually a pleural effusion. So if you see this, notice that this is actually not a pericardial effusion, this is a pleural effusion. And one way that I like to remember this is that Oftentimes, you'll see the descending th um, thoracic aorta right here, and pericardial effusion will be anterior to the aorta, and a pleural effusion will be posterior to the aorta. So here, the only reason I bring this up is sometimes people can get confused. Is this a pericardial effusion or is this a pleural effusion? I usually use the aorta to figure that out, but the beautiful part is, guess what? Just by putting this probe in this one position, you can essentially tell me if someone has a pericardial effusion. You can often tell me if someone has a pleural effusion if it's really significant. You you can often tell me if the ejection fraction is grossly normal or grossly low. And again, you're going to be using all of this in the clinical context of whatever patient that you're seeing. Okay. And now the last thing I want to go over today is the Doppler aspect. What is Doppler? Well, in ultrasound, you can actually use the Doppler mode. And the way Doppler works is you may remember um, the Doppler effect, which means that when sound waves are coming up toward you, the frequency changes. And when sound waves are going away from you, the frequency also changes. So we're going to use that same physics to actually tell us when we have something moving in the direction that we think it should be moving versus when something's coming back. And this can be helpful in the heart because guess what? When we have regurgitation or regurgitant valves, you'll see things moving backwards in a way that they're not supposed to be going. And in this view, notice that we have a perfect view of which valve? The mitral valve. And the reason why this is helpful is you can often put a Doppler probe. Um, you can put the probe here, but you can turn on the Doppler mode and you can actually tell me if you're seeing any regurgitation across this mitral valve. And guess what? When you have mitral regurg, that can oftentimes also be a reason why someone is hypotensive, right? Because if so much stuff is hitting the left ventricle, but much of it is moving backwards instead of forwards, that can also be a cause of hypotension. So here is a real life Doppler example, and I want to show you this video because it's particularly enlightening, and you'll see a very interesting regurgitant jet that's actually moving backwards, right? When majority of the blood flow we think should be moving forward, and when the ventricle is actually contracting, much of that blood should be leaving forward out of the aortic valve, some of it is actually going backwards into the left atrium. So here is a common cause um, of hypotension, which could be mitral regurgitation. Obviously, acute mitral regurgitation is a little bit more scary than something that's been well documented. But the cool part is sometimes you might not even hear a murmur on these folks, but you can see it on echo. So with that, we're actually at the end of this first portion of the video. There's so much more to cardiac ultrasound that I want to go over, um, and that's going to be separate videos. But this is the first portion. I wanted to focus on the parasternal long axis view. In the next video, we'll be focusing a bit more on the other types of views that we can get and the type of information that we can get from them. So if you like this video, please drop a like, comment, share, subscribe. It means a lot to me, and I'll see you all in the next one. Peace.